All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. Today I get a chance to revisit a discussion with a person who I can I consider a friend. I also consider him one of the most uh, incredible musicians and artists that I have uh, come to know. Uh, his name's Robert Rich. We interviewed him way back in the dark ages. Uh, actually, I had to look it up, and it was podcast number 35, uh, done in June of 2014. So it was back when Robert and I were young children, and <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about childish things at the time. Now we're all grown up, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have some nice grown-up stuff to talk about. So with that, I will shut up, and we'll talk to Robert. Hey, Robert, how's it going? It's great. Thanks, Darwin. Uh, thank you so much for getting a chance to to chat. I really do appreciate it. Of course. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> so in our initial uh, conversation, one of the things we talked about a fair amount was kind of your background and how you first got into synthesizers and all that kind of stuff. And it was a really great uh, vision into how you got into things and, you know, certainly hearing about your introduction to the, to the Prophet 5 and stuff like that. It, Going back and listening to your work, it's just like really kind of a, uh, it, it was a real match with the kind of music, the music that we were hearing. Um, what I was, what I'm curious about though now, um, six years later, I, I've had six years to think about more questions. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I didn't get a chance to talk to you very much about, but I have always been curious about with regard to your work, is uh, the use of percussion in your work. And I am curious how, first of all, I mean, to what extent did you like study percussion in any way, or were you influenced by certain kinds of percussion or how did you get to it? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of your music. I think the things like a medicine box, for example, where the percussion plays a very specific role in the work that you do. How did, where did you get your ear and your kind of voice in working with percussion? I've always listened to music from everywhere, and uh, I grew up listening to a lot of Indian classical music, and also I love West African drumming and um, you know Egyptian music and things like that. And there's a lot of interesting rhythms to hear in the world. The way I started using hand percussion and shakers and gourd drums and stuff came about from being really bad at programming drum machines. Back in the 80s, when the first, you know, sample-based drum machines were happening, like the Lindrum, and I had friends at Sequential, and they would, you know, the Sequential drum right. drum tracks showed up and things like that. You know, I just couldn't make them groove like a lot of the techno guys are so good at doing. I just, I, my drum programming was always rigid, but I could pick up a gourd drum and just it kind of grooved itself. You know, there was a certain way that you could hit things, and it just felt like part of your body. I didn't really play percussion until... I met the same person who told who showed me how to play flute, a guy named Daryl DeVore, and he was an itinerant flute and percussion salesman back at Stanford University in the late 70s, early 80s. And I grew up near the university, and even before I was an undergrad there, I'd go over there on my bicycle to pick up records at the bookstore because they had a really good section of like electronic music and things. Mm -hmm. I was still in high school. And and there was this beady-eyed shaman sitting there on a Guatemalan blanket selling bamboo flutes. And I'd go over and we'd chat. And uh turns out he was a jazz musician from the 60s, from the free jazz scene. And he was building all sorts of really cool stuff inventing his own instruments. Uh, and he taught me how to play flute and I bought some six, $10 flutes from him. They became some of my first instruments. Right. And he made these wonderful gourd drums with uh, goatskin heads and big dried gourds and they just sounded fantastic. And so I would just pick up these instruments from him and, and they were part of my early arsenal just to figure out how to make sound when I was starting out. We all figure out how to work with whatever tools were around. And back then, there I didn't have a lot of money and there weren't a lot of tools available, not like now when you can you know cover your wall with modulars and things. So it was just um, you know, figuring out how to track percussion loops. I sometime around 1982, 
or maybe 81, I picked up one of the first longer looping delays. It was the Electra Harmonic 16 second delay. Mm. And I quickly figured out how to make some interesting loops in that playing percussion. So it just became a language. You know, you work with the little tools you have. That's really interesting because I, you know, I immediately made the assumption that you found some way to, you know, sort of like do sampled, you know, again, knowing your, knowing your background was sequential, I was like, oh, were you like burning chips with hand drums on it or whatever? <laughs> and I was like, no, you had a, you had a gourd with a head over it, right? It was just playing things. Yeah. I mean, it, I didn't have a lot of equipment, so I just worked with really simple tools. I mean, Daryl DeVore is a fascinating guy. He passed away about 15 years ago, but he had several articles in experimental musical instruments, the, the mm -hmm. magazine that Bart Hopkin published. And he was teaching what he called sound magic in Marin and, and Sonoma County schools in Northern California, oh, wow. and eventually came to know Tom Waits because he was teaching Tom's <laughs> kids in school. Oh. And from the way Dar from the way Daryl told me, he basically said he gets this phone call from one of his kids, one of the students' fathers is, "Hi, this is Tom Waits, and I really like some of the stuff you're doing with my kids. I was wondering if you'd like to come over and play some instruments with me." So the album's Bone Machine and a couple of the others from that era used a lot of Daryl DeVore's instruments, bamboo and, you know, strange percussion. And I used a bunch. There's an instrument called a mallet kalimba that he showed me how to build with spring steel, and you would put it on a foam ice chest and play it with ping pong ball mallets. <laughs> and I used that a lot. I used it um, on Geometry and Numina in, in 1985. There's a piece called Moss Dance that uses this instrument that Daryl showed me how to build a lot of homemade instruments, you know, he would do like ocarinas out of, out of film canisters and soda straws and right, right. a rubber band instrument that I ended up making a sample for emu with. Uh, in fact, it was, Daryl called it a spirit catcher. And it was, it was these, it was the long stick with a big, heavy rubber band around it. And you'd spin it and it would sound like a, uh, it would sound like an Aboriginal instrument, you know. <laughs> I made this sample along with many other samples I did for Emu on their Proteus Three, the, mm -hmm. the World Box. Yeah, yeah. And about a year later, there's a song on an album by Dead Can Dance called Spirit Chaser, and it opens up with a <laughs> with the sound of that <laughs> instrument from the Proteus Three. In fact, the whole lot of the rhythms on that album are on the pro from the Proteus Three. So it was kind of funny because, you know, there's these these little threads of musical contribution from everybody kind of weave throughout the musical world. And you realize that it's a really small family of things interacting with each other. Yeah, right. I mean, you still kind of have this part of your practice that is building your own instruments. You, you know, I think you still use uh, your own PVC-based flutes and stuff, right? Yeah, that was out of necessity because I was playing these bamboo flutes and started building new PVC flutes when I was trying out new tunings because I do mm -hmm. a lot of work with non-equal temperament. Right. And then about 15 years ago, I wrecked my hand real bad in an accident. I slipped with some glass and uh, it kind of made kept my, my, my right hand doesn't move properly anymore. It's about, mm -hmm. about half of it's numb and it, the, okay. two of the fingers move together only, you know, they can't separately move. So... I had to rebuild all of the flutes that I was playing with with a thumb hole and only two bottom holes on top for the for the right hand so that I could use the thumb instead of oh, because I, I couldn't right, move right. my fingers separate. Sure, right. So then I suddenly had to start building all of the flutes from PVC pipe and putting holes where I could actually reach them, <laughs> which always limited the tunings. Well, yeah, but I mean the flip side of it is it's it's sort of like congratulations to Daryl for opening the door of basically saying, hey, this is a whole practice, right? This is this is a whole thing that the, the door is open for you. And by by already having some comfort in doing that, it wasn't a big leap for you to say, well, I'm, I have this one limitation. I can find a way to make an instrument that still helps, helps me work, right? Well, and I think part of that wonderful lesson from Daryl is to pursue the joy and the play of building instruments and learning how to play new things. To make your own sounds from scratch is just so much more invigorating and more, I don't know, life enhancing mm -hmm. than to sit through long lists of presets and try to figure out which sounds fit your music. I'd, I'd rather just kind of make an instrument, figure out how to play it, and then, then start writing a piece around it. 
um, there's more of a sense of play and of discovery. Just yesterday, actually, I was having a little brief interchange with Kubias Reed Gazala, mm. who is the person who invented the, yeah. the, the phrase. Circuit bending. Uh, yeah. Circuit bending, yeah. And um, he also wrote things for experimental musical instruments, the same magazine. You know, I was just basically saying, I just remembered how he was such a joy to discover this idea of play, really, of, of uh, the the openness of experimentation without rules and without the idea that you have to do anything right or that there's no right or wrong, you know. So, I mean, and, and that's part of how I ended up doing a lot of work with synthesizer companies, making sounds and doing a lot of things from scratch, because... I firmly believe in envisioning possible instruments and then then trying to see them come to fruition, you know. And so having that long time friendship with employees at Sequential Circuits has since come around and doing preset design for Dave Smith instruments and now right. it's called Sequential again. Mm -hmm. So like just last September, uh, November area, I was doing design for the new Pro 3 synth. Along with Drew Newman and a couple other people, I did a lot of the wavetables for it okay. and then a whole bunch of preset design for it. And, you know, so it's again, it's getting back to that sort of area of invention or trying to envision a new sound and create it from scratch. And uh, that's also what's happening right now with um, synthesis technology and the E520 DSP. Um, yeah. Hyperion processor, he calls it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and a lot of that was because I had conversations with Paul Schreiber back in the late '90s about the future of analog synthesis. Because I'd been publicly saying for years, even I wrote an editorial in Electronic Musician back in the mid '90s about the possibilities of in intelligent design behind synthesizers, like having macros. I called it a gruz knob, something mm -hmm. where you could be very intuitive about pushing into a uh, synth and having it react in a complex way, uh, not just a whole bunch of knobs, but 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 certain kinds of uh, controllers that would be mapped to somewhat chaotic variables. And so I'd been talking about this whole idea of using modular synthesizers in a context with DSP and computers behind the modules. Like you're still using this idea of knobs and patch cords and voltages, right. but now we've got these wonderful microcontrollers that can do very sophisticated things. And you don't have to think about the sophistication. You can simply have a few knobs in front. And so, so a lot of that, I think a lot of that approach stems from being unafraid to build things from scratch, you know, including cutting a PVC pipe in half and you know, <laughs> drilling holes in it. It's really the same idea. Right. And well, and also the time you spent with Pia gear and stuff also gave you a sense of having your fingers into it. Oh yeah. John Simonton, my goodness, we owe yeah. him such a, <laughs> we owe him curses and blessings all at once. <laughs> yeah, so true. Um, but talking about this uh, E520, the Hyperion processor, I mean, one of the reasons we're having this discussion is I had been talking with Paul about the, uh, the efforts that he's been putting into it. And it's really quite a remarkable machine because of the amount of time that he's putting in on voice and algorithm design. And he mentioned that you were actually very influential in terms of the kinds of effects and the kind of effect algorithms that were chosen to be uh, built into the system. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, you've done, you've collaborated with a lot of people on making, making, um, presets or patches or whatever, but this is very, it sounds like you're very much in the weeds in terms of helping them, mm -hmm. uh, helping Paul design what the, what the machine itself, what the engine itself is going to provide. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of history to this, but we need to mention Eric Brombaugh because he is an absolute genius and he's doing the work of three or four people, at least. If you look at, you know, great processors in history, let's say like the Eventide H3000, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's one person who was the main brain behind that, oh, but probably right, a team right. of six or eight people sure. who ended up, you know, building that. This is pretty much just Paul Schreiber doing hardware and Eric Brombaugh doing software. I mean, Eric is incredible. And he's so much fun to work with because he's so undefended. You know, like a lot of engineers, if you say, you know, what, why does it do it this way? And they'll go, oh, well, because this is the best way to do it. Uh -huh. He'll be, we're very open about, well, do you think of a better way? 
you know, how should we do this? And if you find a bug, he thanks you. He doesn't say, oh, that's not a bug, that's a feature. He goes, really? Oh, man, I missed that one. Mm. You know, it's, it's just like a really beautiful interaction. What has happened for the last decade or two decades is that sometimes Paul will, will call me up and say, I'd like to do something that's a da-da-da. What do you think it should do? And, and so that started like with, with the wavetable oscillator, the, what is it, the, the 350? He basically said, I'd like to do something a bit like a PPG or a wave term or something, but I want it to sound good. <laughs> you know? right, right. And so it took me about three months to come up with wavetables that had no glitches in them. Mm-hmm. And, and then what Eric Brombaugh did is basically come up with these amazing smoothing algorithms that could morph between these wavetables. And then the main innovation we had there was that, that I conceived of a kind of grid of harmonic complexity so that there would be vectors that could move in an intuitive way so that the higher the voltage, the brighter the sound. And that's something that if you look at the, uh, like the wave term and the old PPG stuff, it, mm-hmm. they were but much more zippery and chaotic. They didn't really act in a normal sequential kind of harmonic way. And so the idea was to, to we could stick some of the noisy things in there, some glitchy waveforms, but the whole first bank I had kind of conceptualized as a whole bunch of complex sine waves, right. very smooth, something that wouldn't even need filters. So that was, again, one of those things where Paul calls me up and says, you know, can you help me with this? I should mention I don't get paid by him. <laughs> I, I get I get free gear. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, note to of, Paul, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> this is all free labor. <laughs> but uh, but a lot of it, though, is is this sense of play, and it's a sense of fun. Right. And so, so about a year ago, I think it was March of of 2019, he does the same thing. He calls me up and says, you know, finally, we've got a chip that's fast enough to do these things you've been asking for. Mm -hmm. Because what I was saying for years is, you know, these Michael Norris spectral filter plugins that work on the Mac, couldn't we do that on a modular? Wouldn't that be amazing to have some of these time domain spectral, weird, bendy kinds of sounds, but behind a patch panel. And Eric has been right on the forefront of that. In fact, he did something for, um, he he did the Spectre uh, um, for audio damage, which is a little module that basically freezes sound using spectral uh, effects. And, you know, this is basically with a FFT and you've got bins and it samples the bins whenever the gate is high and then it sort of extends the FFT. It just basically freezes the sound right there. And so Eric really knows his DSP chops. And for him, the next step was, okay, now we've got this ARM processor that can run rings around the old chips that they were using for these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this processor is, I mean, this is like something that's about at the level of, of a, of a Xeon Mac circa, you know, 2000 and six, maybe, or something. I mean, in 2008, this is a very powerful chip. So, the the challenge then is okay let's try to think of things that are weird and cool and unique and new taking a lead from some of the classic things that we love so you know i still have my eventide h3000 although it's starting to get really questionable the dsp is probably on its last legs and i've already replaced it once um and so but there's certain things in there that i just love the kind of squelchy echoes with filters in them and the slight pitch shifting and, you know, kind of resonant resonators and things like that. And so, you know, looking at some of the cool rhythmic effects that that had, I basically wrote this text document. I've actually got it open in front of me right now on my computer. And there's, there's, there were just a whole bunch of brain farts, basically a bunch of splatter of concepts, ideas, you know, a voter filter, things, that's something I loved Mm -hmm. on the old Insonic uh, ASR 10 that was done by the, uh, Wave Boy. So a guy who worked at Insonic created this fantastic filter frame, you know, did, using the, the effects chip in the mm-hmm. Insonic. And I made so much heavy use out of that in the late 90s, making everything talk, you know, like you put a bunch <laughs> of white noise into the input of your sampler and out, you know, comes this, you know, robot speech. It's wonderful. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was one. And, uh, you know, like resonators. And one that is actually in this new unit, uh, I called it the chowder delay. 
And this was essentially um, the idea of a bunch of stochastic, messy, glitchy echoes. So, you know, it would basically be, a, you could make it pitch up, pitch down, stutter, go backwards, all based on sort of stochastic settings. So the the higher the knob setting, the more likely it would be to, to glitch. Okay. And uh, so a lot of these ideas that I came up with were trying to figure out how to do a lot of complex things with very few voltage inputs. Um, and that's an important idea here because the challenge for doing some of these wonderful Michael Norris algorithms is that he's got a sort of standard Mac user interface with 10 or 20 sliders on it, right? right, right. You can just add another software parameter and make it move. You yeah. can't do that on a piece of hardware. <clears throat> or you can, so, but you'll end up with a $3,000 piece of hardware, right? Right, right. And so so there were certain concepts that, uh, so well, first of all, you know, Paul gets to me with a set of specs. He says there's gonna be four voltage inputs, there's gonna be two feedback controls that are voltage controllable, a tap tempo and a blend, you know? So, mm -hmm. okay, what can you do with that? Oh, and four buttons and a soft controller. Okay, so we've got a fair amount of voltage controllability here, but but you also want things to be somewhat intuitive. Nothing bugs me more than to buy an expensive Eurorack module and not really have it do anything until you read the manual and sit there and program it. Um, right. I, I love IntelliGel. I have a lot of their stuff, and I was one of the early adopters on the Rainmaker, which is a favorite weird processor delay, and that's doing some of these cool things we're talking about, DSP with, you know, multi-tap delays and filtering and pitch shift. But one thing that drives me crazy about it is that it's very much a preset oriented idea. You have to program it and then you recall a preset. Sure. It's not really encouraging you to to just wiggle. You know what I mean? It, yeah. you, you, I wanted something that was really live that had all of the parameters up front that discouraged that kind of tweezy mentality, but encouraged a kind of sandbox. So uh, for me, with a modular synth design, it shouldn't have any layers. It shouldn't have any memories even. I really don't want it to do too much. I want it to do one thing deeply and weirdly, mm -hmm. you know? And so to a certain extent, we're compromising on that. This does have memories, but the memories are the hidden part. The memories are down and the algorithms are up. It's, okay. It looks like a flat interface. You scroll to a different algorithm and now you're in a live sandbox. You know, you've got your Legos right in front of you. You don't have to sit there and, and build your Lego building <laughs> and save it and then right. recall it, right? That just drives me crazy because it's not the spirit of modular sense. So true. Right. Um, so the idea was, can we have everything sort of live? Can we have everything dangerous? And, and this can come back to bite you because, you know, we, our general approach to this is not to make it safe. It, it goes to 11, the feedback will scream, the, the, the filters will go into full resonance. And so if you switch algorithms from one to the next, and if you have all of your knobs up at full and the next algorithm has a filter resonance set well you're gonna scream <laughs> it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna explode so we've gone back and forth a lot about whether that's a big problem or not mm -hmm. and i think we're all sort of on board with the idea that it's dangerous but it's not a problem right we want it to be dangerous we want it to be live and um Part of this, you know, I, I have a, a rather disappointing memory of helping EMU uh, with, with their Morpheus module back in the early 90s. And I was part of the team that was doing filter frames for this amazing vector filter, uh, the H-chip. We came up with some really cool things, and there were some filter frames that I designed that could basically um, shift between odd and even harmonics if you had everything tuned correctly. And it was really very specifically oriented towards um, certain samples, like you had to, to tune the filter to the sample. Okay. And then it could create some amazing effects that were really like, you know, like plastic in your hands. But the problem was that the, the DSPs weren't fast enough to put data limitation on the, the it was a, 
a Z filter, Z plane filter. Z-plane, and so you yeah. had these basic nodes and troughs in the filter. Right. And the problem is you could define things that were so resonant and two resonant peaks could cross each other and explode and you would get full mm. code white noise coming out of the speakers. Yeah, and a, and a blown filter, right. And a, and a blown tweeter, yeah. So the marketing department at EMU, I have to say probably wisely, <laughs> put the lid on the box. They said, okay, this will not be programmable. The, the choice of samples is going to be locked in. There were actually, in the prototypes, we could actually have put chips in with our own samples. Wow. And the, the filter frames were loadable from a piece of software. You could uh, send your parameters down to the prototype, and it would save it, and you could make your own filter frames. It was so powerful. Mm-hmm. And, and when they came back with this, no, we're not going to allow that, then I, I was very sad because they they really deadened a lovely concept and they made it kind of less interesting. Yeah. Very, very less interesting. We wanted to avoid that caution. And yes, this this can blow a tweeter if you're not careful, you know. So it's probably, at least when we're developing things, we're, it's a pretty good idea to put a limiter on <laughs> put the Put a limiter on the end. Well, but that's, yeah. I mean, realistically, sort of like the the lack of baby bumpers is one of the things that is kind of charming about modular synths, I think, you know, it's the fact that it by bolting stuff together yourself, you're sort of preventing someone else from saying, no, 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 you can't do that. Exactly. And that's in a modular environment. You should be able to, to put a 10 volt peak to peak five Hertz square wave through your speakers, right? Right, right? Yes. You'll blow your speakers. But <laughs> but you should have but, the right to do it. <laughs> that's what modulars can do, yeah, you know. Right, exactly. So um, true. I've done I've done some sound design with two oscillators that were both modulating each other at hypersonic frequencies, so they were both set above fifteen or twenty kilohertz, mm-hmm. and their FM was going to each other. So what happened was basically a theremin. It was a devi- It was a FM d- difference tones, and so it was right. the most chaotic. Like it, it was basically like an FM radio, and you were hearing the the modulation tone. Right, the, um, like the sub, like subharmonics at that point, right? The subharmonics of hypersonic uh, yeah. oscillators, oh, wow. and the fact that an, a modular system would let me do that was exactly how some of this insane, crazy, chaotic sounds could happen. Sure. So we're we're still we're very much in that mindset, um, and. Trying to avoid the sort of cursor enter preset mindset of you know like the '90s synths you know, yeah. you know with with a with a big knob and a bunch of buttons. <laughs> well, um, one of the things though that this implies is you talking about or imagining or ideating some sort of a idea and having Paul and Eric put something together and you test it. The testing process and getting that iterative stuff done, is that done through like a software emulation or do you have prototyping hardware that you can flash updates into or? Yeah, yeah. there's or, about three or four prototypes out in the world okay. right now. One is in England and is uh, with a bunch of guys who are much more inclined towards rhythmic and more kind of more techno-y sort of. Okay sound design that I'm inclined towards. And what's wonderful about that is that they'll come in with a lot of ideas that I miss because I'm not thinking in terms of like synchronized tap tempo effects. Sure, right. And so they'll come in with requests for a much tighter, um, you know, rhythmic kind of uh, concept. Um, And often my approach is more stochastic and a little bit more like academic music of trying to do things that are, you know, uh, surprising and aleatoric you know so mm-hmm. um so like my chowder algorithm which eric has done such an amazing s- approach with you know the 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 challenge with that was uh you know i was looking at sort of um i don't know if you remember the max headroom video these kinds of max headroom <laughs> sorts of sounds stutter delays right. and um you know it's things that i guess people like BT have become pretty famous for doing by hand, you know, like, and I, I think BT did a plug-in for um, Isotope yeah. um, that does stutter echoes and things like that. So the guys, you know, doing more of a rhythmic approach to this were thinking, you know, I would love to have the pitch shift go all the way to an octave and 
because Eric was worried about it being too glitchy sounding at a full octave, we had kind of limited it to a fifth. It was, I think it only went up to plus or minus 700 cents in the okay. shift. And um, the the interesting point brought out was, well, if we set it to an octave, then it's going to, and, and make it so that it's only an octave, it's going to be a much more rhythmically interesting and more, you know, musically interesting thing for using it kind of for more melodic music, I guess. So I really enjoy having other people's opinions come and set me a little bit straight because I often am, am thinking more in terms of really weird, you know, aleatoric ideas. Um, well, I mean, also there is that, uh, there is that thing that I mean, kind of like no engineer should ever work alone. Right. Because, yeah, yeah, exactly. because your blinds, everyone's blind spots are huge. And, uh, and bright spots are narrow, right? And so I think it always helps to have uh, have a fairly good team of people working on any project because it, you know, you you prevent yourself from going down the wrong rabbit holes or by just doing something that doesn't have the right flavor, doesn't just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes <clears throat> it's interesting. This is one of the very first algorithms that Eric provided before we really got our dialogue down. He could just kind of tried a few things to see if it was possible. He did some things that I had never thought of, and I had trouble even getting my head around, um, because he could. He, he could figure out how to make an algorithm do something. In, in particular, I think the uh, there's something in there called the spectral delays, which mm -hmm. have very unusual ways of um, skewing the bins. Uh, they can raise or lower the bins with, with voltage curves. And make these weird little zippering sorts of noises, so that the there's an FFT going on underneath, but then it's like shifting the bins higher, so you get these yeah, whoop, yeah. Whoop, whoop, really unusual effects. Which, when you try something from that engineering point of view, you're going to get something that a musician might never have thought of because it was something outside of their experience. There was a few others which were amazing, which I had trouble even figuring out how to use. And so in those, we had a lot of back and forth trying to figure out how to make it understandable to a musician. And I'm going to actually have the thing over here, so I'm going to remind myself. It was the um, time machine. There's an algorithm that uh, it's, it's called the spectral time machine right now. And it's um, based upon some software. There's a plugin. I, I don't know the software personally. I haven't tried it. But it's it's a very strange, basically it's a buffer that you can imagine like a uh, a piece of tape, and you've got you've got a your hands on a tape recorder and you're holding the reels and you're rubbing the tape back and forth over the playhead, and there's a record head too, and the record head and the playhead are sort of next to each other, and there's sound going in, but you can sort of stop the tape and make it go backwards. Um, and speed it up and slow it down. You can do this with voltages. And you can create the most puzzling, really strange effects of like real-time bending of, of frequency and time. You're basically, there's, there's live audio coming in, and then you're making it play backwards at half speed, or you can have it go slower, but with a pitch shift upwards, right? Mm, so... Right. You can make a munchkin talk very <laughs> slow. And then you can freeze it so that sound, so like you've munchkinized the sound, and then you're freezing it so that it's just going on one vowel. Right, right. And it's it's very strange. Um, it's it's really, you know, like, you know, it's Einsteinian strangeness. And, um, and the problem was none of us could get our head around how the, record and playback were working because the buffer was always live. And so it took us a while to figure out that, oh, okay, well, if we treat it like a looper and mm -hmm. have a record button and a play button, then it kind of is something that we can get our head around. Right. Because now it's a little bit more like a musician. It's like something we've tried before. Sure. Rather than this very confusing sort of the buffer is always recording and you're always playing it back different. It's, yeah, yeah. So oftentimes, well, also, I finishing or let's say not finishing that thought but jumping to the next parallel thought a related idea here is that we put a lot of easter eggs in this thing so sometimes the testers 
are very confused because they imagine that some algorithm is going to be great for something. They just can't figure out where it is. And we'll say, oh, no, it's in there. Just do this. You know, turn the feedback knob to the left and now you've got a filter, things mm -hmm. like that. So there's a fair number of tricks that we're trying to put a lot of depth into each algorithm with only six voltages and, and a tap tempo gate, you know. Um, yeah, well, so. I was going to actually ask about that because some of these algorithms you're talking about, I mean, when you're talking about things like spectral delays and spectral manipulation, um, the software that works on these things generally has multiple sliders per bin and stuff, and they'll take up like your whole computer screen right. with just its control mechanisms, right? Um, in this case, you have to boil everything down. So there are like four parameter knobs, four modulation, control modulations, control voltage modulations, and four buttons and kind of a central control. Right. What are the kinds of things you do to wedge sort of like massive parameter sets into, uh, I mean, because on the one hand, frankly, on the one hand, people's first reaction when they look at this module is probably like, oh my God, that's the size of a Buick. You know, but on the well, other hand, this thing will never, this thing will never fit in a, you know, a four U or something. Yeah, right. Well, right. Especially in these days of two HP modules, right? It's not having, gonna happen. Having something like this origin initially seems crazy, but then as you start talking about this, it's just like literally to be able to have access to the kind of parameters that this needs in a useful way and without it being overly presetted. I, I think that's the thing that I hear about that, that I'm hearing that I like the most, which is that it's not oriented towards press this button seven times to get to a certain algorithm, and then this one knob does three variations of magic. That's right. right. See, the, the voltages are always live, and so it's always paying attention to six voltage inputs. Four mm -hmm. of them are for the parameters. There's a little secret parameter extra that we've got, which the... Uh, the feedback knobs, left and right feedback, they zero at noon. And so they go negative to the left and positive to the right. And there's a voltage attached to each of them. Mm -hmm. So, and also a, a CV, you know, a, a, a gain input, you know, for the CV, right. a controller right. to adjust how much that external voltage is being paid attention to. Mm -hmm. So we can sometimes put little Easter eggs in the feedback knobs because it's, they're just, controllers as well. All of the knobs are actually going to the computer, right? Okay. right. And so, well, except for the, the, the voltage attenuators are analog, oh. but the, um, everything the else acts that, as parameters into the algorithm. Then. That's right. So we okay. can redefine feedback if we want. Uh, There's a right. lot of times like in delays, it makes sense to have a positive phase and a negative phase feedback. Mm -hmm. But in other times, it might be possible to sneak something else under there. So for example, uh, Eric has come up with an amazing uh, version of a spectral freeze, which has a few features that are different from Michael Norris's awesome spectral freeze, which I've used for years in my sleep music, you know, to slow things down and make like infinite drones. So Eric is facing some limitations in the active memory in the DSP. So Unlike a computer, we don't have gigabytes of operational RAM, right? right? So there's a, there's a fair amount of buffer RAM. We got like up to 16 minutes of delay buffer RAM, right? So we can have incredibly long looping delays if we want. But the, to do a FFT, there's only a few megabytes. So, so we can't do these crazy long FFT time windows you can do in Michael Norris plugins. So right. Sure. I often do my infinite drones with 16,000, you know, K of buffer time. Mm -hmm. And that's within the bin. So each bin of the FFT is accumulating an average over like eight seconds. Right. Um, and we can't do that. We're, we're really limited to a, an internal RAM limitation that's like, you know, we can get about a half second or a quarter second on each bin, which okay. is still a lot. Oh. But but there's going to be a sort of drone of about 48 hertz if you turn all of the randomization off. Mm -hmm. So it kind of has its internal sound, and that's just because <laughs> of the sample rate of right. the processor. So what Eric has found out how to do is to turn off some of the grid quantization and some of the 
variance that to turn on or off the variance that is available on a drone maker kind of plugin. And we've snuck it into the feedback. So basically, there's like a what, what we've called pinging, which is basically by changing the quantization characteristics of the pitch within the FFT, if your feedback is zero, it's at noon. If you turn it to the right, it does sort of the standard drone maker kind of thing, but you turn it to the left and you get these strange little bell tones that are coming within the algorithm because it's actually using a different kind of grid quantization. Interesting. Um, and so there's a lot of really deep and subtle Easter eggs that are hidden within each algorithm. We're trying to make this this depth in the algorithm be immediately available with voltage control. There's another place where one of the controls, I think there's a few algorithms, I forget which one's right now, where a control will both increase the peak of a filter, you know, the resonance of a filter and the pitch of the filter at the same time. So one knob will sort of create um, a, a dual sound. Um, you know, it's we can throw a few different parameters under a couple knobs and kind of make it complex. Another way of doing this is with randomization. So like with the stutter echo, the knobs actually increase the likelihood that a certain event might happen. And well, so and you can also build ways. all kinds of like swarming kinds of feelings and stuff using randomization as well when it comes to Absolutely. effects processing, right? Yep. And so we're doing a fair amount of that. So between the ability to go, you know, it, certain algorithms, it really makes no sense to have negative phase feedback, mm -hmm. like a looper, for example. Right. right. Yeah. So what we can do then is turning the feedback to the left, it might add a different kind of distortion. Different kind or of function, might, right. It might add some filter cutoff, you know, to, to make it murky, sure. um, things like that. So we're doing a lot of ganging. Um, yeah. But then also it's sometimes it's simply making educated guesses about what are useful parameters to fix into the, into the algorithm. You know, just, my own feeling is that I want to keep that sandbox feeling of putty in my hands when I'm in a modular environment. And so I, I, I don't want people to have to read a manual to use a module. You know, I think that there's a certain amount of turn until it sounds cool yeah. kind of mentality. Right. That, that there should be enough chaos and enough weirdness that you can be surprised. And that once you get to learn an algorithm deeply, you can dive in really, really deep and, and get some really significant things. You know, sure. so, so like you can take a, uh, you know, some resonators or a flanger kind of thing and you can turn it into a car plus strong synthesizer, right? So that's in there. Right. You know, you, you you take a short delay and it suddenly becomes, a, you know, a pingable delay. And you see, you, now you've got a car plus strong synthesizer and that's right. possible. So from a musician's standpoint, how do you take something like this? I mean, this is going to be like a whole new set of kind of like fungible tools for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you integrate that into your musical practice? Because in a way... A lot of the instruments that you use, you've been using forever. Um, some of them you've been using at, at the very least for quite a while. And I'm wondering how you take, you know, so you talk about things like having an H3000, which has been part of your kind of practice for a long, long time. Uh, your use of the, of the pedal steel has been something you've used for a long, or the lap steel is something you've used for a long time. How do you take something brand new and find a way to integrate it into your own work so that it it can kind of meld its way in without it being just an irritant of like, ah, I have a gig to do and <laughs> this is just in a way, right? Well, there's there's a couple approaches to that. I mean, one is the is the sandbox play approach where every musician knows that having a new toy can create new ideas. That, that you can be inspired. And so, you know, my hope is that this will inspire a lot of people to explore radical new sound design. I tend to treat modular synths myself personally as, as a place to explore sound design. So, and oftentimes like in my own music, what people think are nature recordings mm -hmm. might be a blend of actual acoustic night sounds and things coming off the modular that sound like underwater you know, bubble creatures and, you know, weird science fiction whales and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, or even just birds and insects 
oftentimes they're patches. There's certain tricks that I've learned over the years of, you know, like really narrow um, pulse width uh, oscillators at low frequencies through resonating filters to create little crickets and cicadas and things like that. And so oftentimes when I'm working on a new album, I'll set up patches on the modular and just have the recorder ready to go at all times. And as soon as something interesting starts happening, I just push record and I explore with the record running, you know, mm -hmm. and I might only get a minute or two or 20 seconds of interesting stuff out of there, but I let myself be in the moment and just make a new sound, like especially chaotic um, approaches of looping, feedback of outputs of a patch into the inputs of a patch. And if you do feedback patches, then it's really nice to have some time domain, some delays and things. Pure analog synthesis with no digital buffering, you know, like with no delays, uh, becomes really hard to do a lot of chaotic things because you have uh, the feedback becomes pretty much hard feedback very quickly. Right. You just get right. screaming. But as soon as you start bringing in some of these nonlinear effects and time domain effects, then your chaotic patches can become very surprising and very interestingly different and hard to control. You know, I, I liken some of these tricks to being on a tanker ship with an iceberg long in front of you and you have to start turning, <laughs> you know, two days before the iceberg is there because you're not going to be able to turn fast enough. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, so so you've got these big slabs of electrons that are moving around sort of slightly outside of your control. Sure. And I love that chaotic place where I'm just out on a limb. Um, you know, oftentimes the speakers are turned way down because it could just end up exploding. Um, and I think a, a device like this, because of the, the complex spectral nature, the very nonlinear kinds of things that are possible, um, a lot of time domain, um, it'll be really encouraging for that kind of play, you know, for pure experimental sound design. I think though a lot of people who do dance music and more rhythmic music will find the tap tempo and the clockability of it to be really interesting mm -hmm. because you can put a gate into the tap input and you can drive it for, with an external clock. And so a lot of these very complex timbral echoes, you know, things like the spectral d delay and reversing things or the chowder delay can make what's coming into it come out in different, very abstract sequences. One of the ideas that that go into the chowder delay was a thing that came out of Cal Arts that it was, it's one of my favorite radical plugins. It's uh, called Argyfonti's Liar. Oh, do you yeah. know about this? I do. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful program. Akira Rabelais was the guy who uh, wrote it. I don't know his, uh, his human name. That's his artist name. Right. And he wrote it as a graduate student at Cal Arts back in the nineties, perhaps a um, long time ago anyway. And there is one module within Argifonti's Liar. And if you've ever used it, you know how crazy it is. You almost don't know how anything's working. Correct. Um, it automatically assigns random words to your <laughs> files when it, when it creates them. And whenever you start processing a file, it creates this little animation of two people hammering on a piece of metal. It's wonderful. It's just really quirky. Um, and one of the plugins is called Eviscerator Reanimator. And I've used this for experimental pieces. Um, and what you do is you put a bunch of audio files into a folder with different names and you alphabetize the names to be the sequence that you want them to be chewed upon. And the eviscerator reanimator basically goes down through each file alphabetically and takes a grain from each one in series and loops around back to the start and slowly builds a new file of a granulated mix and mash of whatever mm. files you have in that folder. Right. It's very ill. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's medically crazy and it's wonderful. It's really insane. And uh, you can make some very disturbing sounds out of this. So the idea was that using some of these stochastic processes and the chowder delay, what we can actually do is rearrange the audio that's coming out. So audio will come into the 520. And then if you set yourself up with a really big buffer, you know, like 20 seconds, mm -hmm. You can set the sequence of the output so that it's actually doing an eviscerator reanimator with real time audio. Oh, and sure. it's taking okay. chunks that happened earlier and chunks that happened more recently. Can it can play them back right. backwards and forwards. It can play them back at different pitches. And then mm -hmm. using 
using the feedback controls, you can make those pitches go, you know, like up and down and, and it, it becomes a, a real time, you know, sicko making machine. It's a wonderful, wonderful, sick thing. I was just actually having a conversation with someone else uh, today where we were talking about, you know, there are a lot of people who are very skilled at DSP and making things work like audio processors that we've experienced in the past. But there's sort of like this whole aspect of um, potential manipulation that just says, hey, audio is also data, right? It's numbers. Mm -hmm. And what happens if you take little segments and sort them? What happens if you take little segments and shuffle them up? Uh, you know, that's what this sounds like this reanimator thing does, right? If well, you if started treating it time. like, yeah, if you started treating it like data instead of like audio content, there's like a whole area of effects processing that hasn't really been explored that much yet. Right. And that's the spectral domain allows for even a deeper version oh, sure. of that data right. approach. And so, for example, with the modulation of the spectral delays, you're basically doing what you've described, you know, with the, the chowder delay, it's doing it in a time domain, right. but in the spectral delays, it's doing it in the, in the FFT domain. Frequency so it's in the domain, frequency right. domain. Yeah. And so now what you can do is you can start putting data from one frequency bin into another frequency bin. Mm -hmm. You can say, I'm just going to put this 50 Hertz chunk over here. And there's voltages that tell you the pattern that you want to do that. There's, there's like built-in sine waves that you can change the frequency of. There's curves with slopes, so you can make it slope upwards so that it's like a bucket brigade. Every bin will get tossed to the next it's higher bin or the next over. lower bin. Right. Yeah. And so you're essentially doing that in the frequency do domain. And once you can start doing that, well, pretty much all bets are off. You can be <laughs> in a very, very nonlinear place. Now, <laughs> Now, now the, the question is how to, how to get your head around it right. so that you can come up with musically interesting ideas. It's one thing for all of us to dream about a sound nobody has made before, right? We, we, when we're in the world of synthesis, we imagine somehow a module doing things that nothing else has done. Well, and when you actually start looking at most of the options that happen in the nonlinear realm, and you can hear this with a lot of the Eurorack inventions that have come out, Almost all the time, it simply sounds like a new kind of distortion. Yeah, right. Because you're simply adding harmonics to things. And mm -hmm. what is that? It's distortion. And so to get something that's actually musical and not sounding like distortion, but uniquely different from something you've heard before, turns out to be really, really hard. <laughs> because you, you can try something that's mathematically completely different from what anyone has ever tried, and you end up hearing, oh, gee, it's another kind of distortion. Yeah, right. or, or gee, it sounds like an echo with a filter, or it sounds like something <laughs> blurry. You know, so, so we very quickly organize our sensory information into experiences that we've had before, and we name them very quickly. We're amazing at that. We are structuring, we're organizing animals, you know. Yeah. Our brains put things into logical groups on shelves immediately. So to come up with a shelf that nobody has ever dreamed of before, it's like coming up with a color that nobody's ever seen before. It's a lot harder than it sounds. Right. <laughs> so a lot of the time I'm struggling with just trying to come up with something that isn't yet another echo with distortion, <laughs> right? Oh, gee, it's a different kind of echo. <laughs> you know? yeah. it, well, you say has, that like that's a bad thing. <laughs> it has diffusion this time. Right. You know, but, and sometimes a very simple tweak can make a very radical change. So an example of that, one of my favorite effects in my lifetime, one of my favorite effects boxes was the Sony R7 reverb. Um, I, I had that as my basic reverb for mixing all throughout the 90s. The thing came out around 1991, mm -hmm. 1990 perhaps. And I was using, two, I had one blow up on me, so I found another one used, and then that one blew up on me five or six years later. All of them by now, that are out in the field, probably their DSPs have blown up because they just, they, they stopped working basically. Mm -hmm. okay. And there's nowhere to fix them. You know, the DSP was custom. Right. And so the last one I had, I think, gasped its last breath about six years ago, maybe. But there was a, a reverb phase shifter algorithm in the R7, which sounded more phase shifty than anything I have ever used before in my life. It was so swishy. It was just like you were getting sucked through a black hole. You know, like, <laughs> it was just cool. 
And I couldn't get that sound anywhere. And I was trying to reverse engineer what was happening with it. And I realized that it was very simple. They simply had a diffuser before a swept phase shifter. Okay. Right? And so that's nothing fancy. Right. It was just a really good implementation. A smart I mean, very, tweak. Yeah. Just a really easy tweak. And so that was one of the easier things that Eric got working. And um, it's it's in the phase shifter. It's, it's what is it called? It's called diffusion phaser, I think. Um, uh, I'm cheating now because I forget some of these <laughs> things. It is just a very, very swishy or flanger, I guess. Did we... No, it's not. It's the flanger. Stereo flanger delay is what it's called. And yes, so so it's a flanger with a diffuser at the front. It's just deep. You know, it's a, it's a very rich sounding and very swishy. And, you know, and also there's this new territory we're in, engaging right now, which is dual mono plugins. So basically a way to daisy chain effects. You can't do it with all of them because even this DSP gets a little bit hampered. It can't do to different simultaneous spectral plugins, for example. It's okay. just too much. Sure, of course. But for some of the time domain algorithms, we can actually daisy chain them. And so Eric has gotten that working pretty well. And those are the ones that can really explode, by the way. If you've got like resonance on a... I, I managed to almost make myself go deaf two weeks ago with uh, testing a flanger going into the phaser and setting the feedback so that it was going back into the beginning <laughs> of the loop. And it just... Uh, yeah. It, it took off on you, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, immediately. So, yeah, you have to be a little careful, especially with headphones on, because um, these things can happen. But, uh, you know, we give people enough rope, basically. Sure. So true. Well, Robert, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, and normally, this is the time when I would say, you know, what have you, what have you got on your workbench? Or what are you working on that's about to come out? And the fact of the matter is we're talking about right here, this... Uh, yeah. This E520 is going to, is basically, I think it's uh, the early, uh, the early adopter purchases was going to be ending very soon. So people that are interested in getting a, getting a break on this should, should kind of hop on it. But um, it also sounds like uh, it's really, you know, it's rushing towards completion too. So this is something that we're going to be able to see in people's racks pretty soon as well. So that's really I think exciting. In a couple months. Yeah. yeah, I think a few months, yeah. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, do you have any releases coming up anytime soon? You know, for the first time in ages, it's been a year since my last release, right. uh, which is a two CD set, Tactile uh -huh. Ground. Yeah. And Tactile Ground came out in uh, January of 2019. Mm -hmm. And um, I've just been busy with concerts and this kind of stuff with product design and also tons of mastering work. Okay. So I have a new album in the works, but it's going to be at least another six months away. It's a tough one. A lot of notes, a lot of microtuning, and it's going to be, well, the, the working title of the next album is Neurogenesis. Oh my and, goodness. Um, okay. It's, it's all about, let's say, plasticity of the brain, <laughs> which means it could be a bit of an ear bending album. It might be a real turnoff for a few people. <laughs> ah. Well, um, I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, I will be looking forward to the next time we get a chance to talk. This was really fantastic. Thank you for sharing sort of like the process and the geekery behind uh, behind your work on this uh, processor. This sounds really interesting. I'm anxious to get my hands on it, and uh, I'm anxious to hear what people are going to be able to do with it. And I am having a lot of fun. It's so much fun to work with Eric Brombaugh, too, because he's one of the great geniuses out there right now doing this stuff. That's awesome. Well, thanks a lot for your time. I do appreciate it, and have a great one. It's a pleasure. Thanks. All right. Many thanks to Robert for the great chat. It was uh, fun to catch up. As you could tell, I had some like leftover stuff I wanted to talk about, particularly the thing about percussion. I've always been really wanted to tag him with that question, so I was glad I had a chance. But this was also a, an opportunity because of his work with the uh, Synthesis Technologies um, E520, their upcoming effects module. It was a chance to talk to him a little bit about his development work as sort of a non-technician. And I thought it was really revealing the kinds of things he gets involved in, the amount of interaction he has with particularly the software engineer, uh, Eric. And uh, it was just a neat uh, view on the process. 
Um, I just want to make sure it's clear that uh, I was not paid by Synthesis Technology to do this. I don't even get any free gear. I'm not sure why I did this. Paul, give me a call. But in any case, uh, it's uh, this, like all podcasts uh, that I do, are supported solely by the patrons uh, at patreon.com. So if you're interested in supporting this, in helping drive the future of this podcast, please help out. It's patreon.com slash Darwin Gross, D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Thank you so much for listening. Keep on sharing. Keep on reaching out to me with ideas. Uh, In the last week or two, I've gotten a chance to really follow through on a lot of the suggestions that people had. And so we're going to see a bunch more of those kinds of things happening. Uh, If you have ideas of somebody that you really would like to hear from, uh, reach out. Let me know. Uh, We'll see what we can do. With that, I want to thank you so much, and and I'll let you have a great week. Catch you next time around. Bye.